best. So I call um, Beth, the producer, and say, you know, we can't do it. Sony said no. She goes, well, in the meantime, she goes, that's, she goes, that's bullshit. Mm-hmm. She said, you, they never reject by a cell phone call. So she goes, something's weird. She, I'm going to call this friend of mine at Time Warner. Right. She calls the guy at Time Warner, and the guy goes, they don't own Father Knows Best. They're trying to get Father Knows Best, but they don't own it now. So we're like, uh, okay, what do we do? Um, two weeks later, she called, Beth calls and she goes, have you seen Variety Magazine? I'm like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. I go, no. <laughs> you know, I wasn't taking Variety. I right. wasn't in the film business yet. She goes, Sony is producing a TV show where actors are acting out classical sitcom scripts. So we get a lawyer we take him all of the paperwork, and he goes, oh, yeah, you own it. He goes, there's no question about it. They have stolen this from you. Here's the deal. I want $200,000 retainer, and you will never win. He goes, all you can hope for is that it fails or that it's, it has a huge amount of success. If it fails, you can do whatever you want. If it's hugely successful, then it's worth it for us to go after it. Well, so Sony, the first episode, they get out of like, you know, B-level out of work actors. And they turn this father, they did Silver Spoons was the first (laughs) script they did. And they turned it into this like semi-sexual innuendos between the characters. It lasted two episodes and failed. Wow. But it was really, I mean, you, yeah, so, you, you know, the, 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 the um, you know, the story there is never send anything to Hollywood unless you want them to have it. <laughs> right. You know, and not, and you get nothing for it. But anyway, um, back to whatever we were talking about before that was, um, was what? I think we were talking about, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, how... How how did it all happen? How is it okay. that you 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 know you're you're right. North Texas State, and you That's and I think you, you know you said I'll, it, I'll it all changed when you got behind the camera. Yeah, it's a very it's a very and, quick story. And so you know, but even when you, so you decide. So by the time you graduate, who do you think you are? Are you? Do you? I think, think I'm you, a filmmaker. Okay. I think I'm going to make motion pictures. Absolutely. All right. Right out of school, I'm offered these two jobs. Um, the story about the Vern Luck was film thing um, was because I wasn't going to work with him. Mm-hmm. There was a situation in the in the newsroom, not not towards me, but but towards everyone else, mm-hmm. that I said I can't I can't do this. And again, it's a I'm a you know I'm a 21 year old arrogant little shit thinking that I'm going to make motion pictures one way or another. Right. Okay, so I couldn't get a job anywhere. I couldn't even get in. I couldn't find a way into the business. I wasn't going to be able to just go to California on my own. I wasn't. Right. I don't have that personality, evidently. Right. Um, so with a lack of anything to do, uh, my father said, why don't you think of a business to open in Denton? I'm like, well, there's only one camera shop. He charges all of us full retail. And it was a time when, like, discount camera shops were coming everywhere. Right. He goes, okay, well, let's look into it. So with $5,000 um, for my father and grandfather, I opened a camera shop. I knew absolutely nothing about cameras. I only knew about 16 millimeter, you know, motion picture cameras. I knew nothing about still photography and, and, and less about business. But because we opened this teeny-weeny store right next to the art department... Right. Which was just starting the film, their their like art camera department. Right. It it went really well. I sold the shop, and then after four years, I just didn't. I couldn't be in a, in a store. You know, right. I just needed to. I started making photographs, enjoying that. So um, this is like seventy eight. This was uh, yeah. This was this was seventy eight. Yeah. Right. And so. Um, we had a little bit of a fortunate situation with my my wife's family's like you know land ownings and so forth, mm-hmm. 
And with the, but mostly it was the money that I was going to get for selling the store that allowed me to go back to school. I said, I want to go back and get, I want to go to the art department uh-huh. and, um, and get an MFA. So while I still had the store going, I, I took some graduate classes um, in North Texas. I took okay. a drawing class uh, from Teal Sale, and I thought I was awful. And she pulls me aside, and I go, I'm terrible. She goes, no, you have something that others don't. And I'm like, I, I have <laughs> no clue what she's talking about because I thought I, I couldn't draw shit. I mean, I can. I just didn't know I could. Um, so I took that and then I started, I took a, 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 a graduate level, uh, photography class or mm-hmm. it was, I think it was a photography class from Al Souza and he introduced us to, to people that like Lucas Samaras and himself that were mm-hmm. making these sort of like fabricated photographs or made, they were using photography to do something else. Right. And so I started thinking, well, I'm just going to do it like I make pictures. I'm going to make up things. You know, I'm going to cover it. I'm gonna... And we were also learning about Susan Sontag's book um, about on photography, which uh-huh. was telling us that photographs don't tell the truth. We think they do. You right. know, of course they don't. I mean, I'm from film. <laughs> right. You know, we never tell the truth. We make the whole thing up. Right. So I didn't, you know, so I took that approach in making it. So then I'm in graduate school, and I make these two photographs. One is I photographed these cypress tree or these cypress trees, and then I photo- photograph them, and then I make a collage on top of the photograph, and then rephotograph it. Mm. So it's all these little pieces of paper is the photograph. You know, that's, I, see that's already you know yeah. artistic. Right. Because it's mark making. Yes, right? it's mark I mean, making. I drew on there. I used sand. I did two of them. One was this stuff, and then one was the view out of my camera shop. I used paper, paint, right. pencil, every artist material I wanted to start learning about, and then I'd re-photograph it. So there was a store. Um, were those in, color? Yes, they were in color. And um, there was a store in Denton, which was like the, you know, really nice, like gift and book store called uh-huh. Vortman's. And every year Vortman um, sponsored a, a, a contest, or what do you got, a contest, I right. guess, of, of the art students in the art department. And they would get a real time curator to come in and jury the show. So I, my fellow students and my good friend um, Steve Denny who ended up being my art dealer and still a very close friend <clears throat> said are you putting anything in the Vartman show and I go I don't even know what the Vartman show is <coughs> excuse me so he tells me I said well I've got these two pieces that was it <clears throat> so I put them in there and he goes so someone says are you going to go to the opening tonight and I, didn't, I, I really sound dumb about this but you know again growing up here with right. no art background except for my mother and the Picasso show. <laughs> right. Um, they, I go. What he goes? Well, you know, that's where they're gonna they're gonna present the owner. I mean, the winners. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So I take these two pieces and I'm like at the last minute and drop them off. So then I go to the show, and um, we already have a kid. I mean, I've been married, you know, four years. I already have a kid, um, a daughter, and. So I go to this thing and I open the door and I walk in. The door it was a steel door, like giant room. I don't remember what room it was. It was not. It was an art department. Right. And everyone turns and looks at me, and I'm like, "She has my zipper down." <laughs> well, I won the whole purchase award. Wow. It was the first time in 25 years of that show that a photograph has won the purchase award. Wow. So the curator or the juror was Linda Cathcart, who is the, the current director of the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. And, um, God, I can't remember the, the teacher that told, came up to me and he goes, look, or he called me over to his house the next day. And um, Ken, 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 I can't remember his last name. Sorry, uh-huh. Ken. And he invites me over and he goes, look, um, the person who jury this show is really an important director of the Contemporary Arts Museum now. Her name is Linda Cathcart. You should meet her. She wants to meet you. 
And so at the meantime, I applied to go to graduate school at the University of Houston. Okay. In the art department. I was accepted. I'm moving the whole family, you know, Jesus, what the hell am I thinking? So anyway, I go down there and I walk in the museum and I go, and she goes, oh, come in. She goes, wow. Well, she's also the person that discovered Cindy Sherman and Robert Longo. Wow. She was in Buffalo as a curator at the time they were in school. So my first museum show was at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston. It's a group show called New Photography with all of these people. And she really helped. She introduced me to Frederica Hunter with Texas right. Gallery, to um, Sue Grays, who I mentioned earlier. And within, so I go to the University of Houston, and I'm there one semester and invited for eight museum shows. Right. It just so happened, when you're making something that curators are looking for, right. it happens really fast. Right. It wasn't anything I did, but I was making these photographs, and it just so happened that people in New York were making, you know, fabricated photographs. Right. And we weren't the first, actually. It was uh, in California, um, Van Deren Koch, the curator, I think it's San Francisco Modern, right. you know, discovered people like John Fall and John DeVola. But they were still making relatively traditional photographs. They were still in the 8 by 10 or 11 right. by 14 size. Ours were you know, 20 by 30 or right. 30 by 40. I mean, they're huge by photographic standards. Right. And so... Um, right. So let me ask you, do you think if... Uh, I mean, there there is a, a sliding door there. Like, do you, do you feel like if you had not been in that Vortman show you know, your life would have taken a different trajectory. Absolutely. Or do you think like it would have, it, it, you know, something like it would have come up well, and you would have it, gotten there? It, because it seems like, you know, this real tipping point. It, well, it was because she <clears throat> was a catalyst for all of us that I mentioned. Right. And, and me and, and me. And as a matter of fact, she was also responsible for my show at Artist Space. No one outside of New York has ha had a show, at a solo show at Artist Space at that time. Mm -hmm. And from that show, um, I mean, I don't, I really, it's, it may be better to be completely naive about your life and let things just happen. <laughs> kind of like, you know, Forrest Gump. Right. Um, <laughs> because I, uh, I, at that time, I did start showing a little bit with uh, Laura Carpenter, and mm -hmm. Steve Denny was head of the photo program there. So I've had this solo show at Artist Space. All of a sudden, one day he calls me and says, "Are you sitting down?" And I'm like, "No, why? What happened?" You know? And he goes, <laughs> "You're in the Whitney Biennial," and I'm wow. like. You know what I'm going to say. I go, what is the Whitney Biennial? <laughs> he, goes, he goes, you're such an idiot. He goes, this is like this huge thing, you know. So I'm in the Whitney Biennial. Then I was in the Guggenheim Exxon show the same year. Um, I think if the uh, uh, the Hershaw or the Corcoran uh, show had photographs, I would have been in that because but it was only a painting thing. Right. That I was told that I would have been if it <laughs> one photograph. Okay, right. whatever that means. Uh, you know, Life Magazine, Newsweek, you name it. It was just crazy. And I'm like, holy shit, this is really fun. Um, and then, uh, you know, then I just kept making the work, basically. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had, I, you know, had a solo show in New York every two years up until, right. like I say, 2008, right. from that period of time. But, you know, it takes, artists have really need a curatorial, a, a cure. A curatorial advocate. Right. You need someone to really help support them. Um, I'm not so sure that writers can do what they used to do. Critics like, you know, um, in the in the 80s, if you had a review in New York Times, people came to see your show. I don't. There's not that many reviews in the New York Times anymore, mm -hmm. or anywhere else for that matter. So I don't know how it happens now. There's a lot of artists. I think it's a lot harder. Right. And there's not movements. You know, when there's a movement like right. staged photographs or, um, at, you know, the, a neo-expressionist or neo-geo or any of that, if there's not that happening, then there's no furor for what finding people that are doing that. Right. 
I got lucky and I, I do feel that luck can get you somewhere.